Hello again. A couple of you have asked a few more questions about this Gauss and Metrowatt. So one of the things that somebody had asked me was how well this thing could measure a capacitor once the capacitor went bad. And of course I've replaced a lot of bad capacitors. Unfortunately, I just don't save those. They go into the dumpster. So I don't happen to have a storage of test capacitors with high leakage or high ESR or anything. But I thought I could run another test where I introduced some series resistance and we could try it. So I've got an RLC meter here. This is made by BK. I actually just repaired this meter recently. And I've got a 1000 microfarad capacitor. I'm just going to install this. You can see it's reading 1.17 millifarads. What I have here is a 10 ohm resistor. So we're just going to simulate a high ESR value of 10 ohms. So if I reattach this capacitor with the resistor, Alright, you can see it's now reading 10.36 ohms and it's uh, 1.172 millifarads. So let's just try this with the Gaussian and we'll see if it sees a difference between these two values. So, and you can see it's reading 1.238, 1.24 or so. And I'll add our 10 ohm resistor and let's see if this makes a difference. And you can see it's roughly the same capacitance. It's got a resistance decade box here. What I'm going to do is put our capacitor in series with this. So this is a 40 ohm resistor. And you can see it's reading 1.093 millifarads. Let's try it with 100 ohms. Oh, now we're starting to see quite a bit of air. So 895 microfarads right now. And let's just try it with our RLC meter again. You can see the capacitance is reading basically the same value with 100 ohms ESR. So yeah, it does seem to affect the reading off of the Ultra. I'd kind of expect this off of any of these meters. I mean, there's a reason that you're going to spend money to buy a good RLC meter versus uh, trying to read capacitance with a handheld meter. So it doesn't surprise me a whole lot. So another question that was asked is if I had my wrist strap still on when I had waved the cloth in front of the meter last time. And I actually had to go to my wife's sewing room to go get this cloth. Um, I don't keep this in my office. but uh, So I had not actually plugged the wrist strap back in. I Normally when I'm wearing it, I just leave it attached to my arm and just leave it on there. And then I, it's got a quick disconnect, so I just pull it off. Uh, you can see this is one of my straps here, but these just pop off of the back. You can just leave the strap on your arm. Anyway, um, but the point I was going to make was that it really doesn't matter if I had the wrist strap on or not. If you have a look at fabrics and how they conduct electricity onto the body, you find that not all fabrics behave the same. So some fabrics actually don't conduct very well to the human body. So depending on the cloth type, it may or may not lose its static charge through your body back to the ground. So most of us are familiar with wrist straps or boot straps and whatnot, but one of the other common things to do is to wear a smock. And these smocks are actually an ESD protective type clothing. You would wear that over the top of your normal clothing. And the idea is that smock is actually conductive to your body. So I'd actually ran tests like this with this cloth, with me grounded, with me not grounded, and it never really made a difference. So another question that came up after I made the last video was, you know, I installed this shield, and of course there's quite a bit of metal there, and I think the concern is if the meter would break down with the higher voltages after I added the shield. Now, keep in mind that the MAV was located about in this area here where my finger would be, and the ground path is out into this direction here. So the majority of the current is flowing in this area right here. I think the clamping voltage on that is going to be, I don't know, somewhere around 2,000 volts or something. I have to go back and look at the data sheet for the parts that they had used. But, you know, somewhere around there. So the question is, is could anything at that 2KV arc on over to the plate? So people are saying, yeah, you know, you probably don't want to rerun those tests because of the amount of time it would take. But I don't think we really need to do that. I've got the 
meter already modified so this has not been touched since the last time I tore it apart and you can see that if I turn it on I'll just zero this thing out real quick and again you can see that my hand is not having any effect on it you know so yeah the shield's still in place on this what we'll do is take this generator which is still strapped for the very last test that I ran which is 12,000 volts and I'll just go ahead and run five transients through each mode of the meter again and let's just see if this breaks down I'm not going to hook up the scope or anything to this. I already know that this uh, generator is set. Like I say, I haven't touched it. All right, so this will be 12,000 volts with a 50 microsecond full width half height with a 2 ohm source impedance. Again, we'll give the meter five transients in each mode, both positive and negative. Batteries were out in the camera. I should mention when I ran this test the last time, if you paid attention in the video, although nobody called me out for it, I didn't actually swap the leads and so I didn't run the other half of the transients. So I didn't even notice that until I had actually created the video and what I ended up having to do was go back and rerun that test. And I thought, well, I'm not going to videotape it because I had already created the video by that point. I thought, well, it'd be interesting because I know a few of you are able to catch quite a few of the bugs that I get into these videos. And I thought it'd be interesting to see if anybody caught that one because that was pretty major. Nobody spotted that I didn't actually swap the leads on that final test. <laughs> so anyway, you just saw me swap them this time. Uh, I have ran this test before. Like I say, uh, I actually ran it. just was off camera last time. So here you go. We'll just begin again. Negative transients, five each. So another thing that I had done with this meter was I enabled the Bluetooth and I turned on the PC where it was communicating with the meter and I was able to walk away from the PC at least 20 feet, probably closer to about 30 feet away uh, before the communications actually ended up failing. So the shield I'm sure has some effect on that, but at least the meter can transmit farther than what I would need it ever to. All right, so I think before we do any testing on this meter, I have our 121GW here, replica. If you watched the last video I made, Dave over at EV Blog had offered to send me one of the two EV Blog 121GW meters. He only has two of them in his possession of the final revision, and there's 10 other ones that are over at Intertech being checked and so those 12 are the only ones that are in existence so we're going to get one of these I guess next week to start doing our own evaluation of it in the meantime we have this one here and I thought what I'd do is just show you again I have a spark plug in the back of this I'm just gonna turn this on and give you some idea what this transient generator is putting out right now So this is what we were just subjecting this gas into. Eh. The spark plug gap just doesn't get it. <laughs> but we still have the UT61E. We'll see here if we can jump across the face of this thing still. So again, that's what we were just applying to the Metro hit. Let's just see how the meter behaves. So, and this should be two and a half volts. And two and a half volts at 60 hertz. And this will be at 30 hertz. And at 15 hertz. 
should be 3.6 volts and two and a half volts roughly and this should be 5 volts and this should be 60 Hertz but again uh, this meter has a bug in it so you can see it's unable to read frequency and again what I have to do is basically rotate this over see it's reading the 60 Hertz back to the megahertz and there's our frequency again yeah, again I don't know what makes it get into this mode but uh, basically every time it gets there that's what I have to do to clear it out anyway so there's 60 Hertz 30 Hertz 15 Hertz so let's try zeroing out the meter with a 0.5 ohm it's with 1 ohm 50 ohms it's 100 ohms 1k 10k 100k 1 meg and 10 megs this is with the meter attached to my fluke reference and currently we're putting out 1 volt I have not let the calibrator warm up but it does appear that the Gaussian is reading just a little bit on the low side. This is currently with one millivolt being applied off of my fluke reference. And you can see the Gaussian reads just slightly high. About uh, 60 microvolts. And compared with the Bryman, which was reading about... Uh, two microvolts low two three microvolts low and this should be roughly 500 degrees and again I can adjust this down or we can go up a little over a thousand this would be a 150 picofarads one nanofarad 0.1 microfarads one microfarad 10 microfarads 100 microfarads almost forgot our diode test so again that's with an open here's with a short and this is a single diode and two diodes and three diodes so yeah it looks like the meter appears to be just fine still well, I think that's going to be it for this video so hopefully that answers all your questions about the Goss and Metrowatt Metrohead Ultra. And again, hopefully in our next video we'll be looking at the 121GW meter by EEV Blog. Stay tuned for that. Later.